for it for a very simple thing. Okay, I hope you can see what I'm seeing, which is this all access thing. And uh, let's talk about all the fun things that happened last week. I think we had the craziest thing happen last week. There are a couple of things in crypto that everybody knows are incredibly improbable. Uh, so one of them is the return of Satoshi, obviously, the movement of the Satoshi funds. Very, very, very unlikely. Could happen, but very unlikely. Um, and, uh, you know, right up there would have been uh, the uh, return of the funds stolen from an exchange. These things never come back. And yet, somehow, the police were able to capture about $4 billion worth of Bitcoin and return it to Bitfinex. Now, this Bitfinex saga is just it goes back multiple years. There's so much blame to be thrown around. I have a saying that fraud and, uh, and malfeasance in, in crypto is just typically fractal. Like the closer you look at it, you uncover another layer and another layer and another layer. But weirdness is also, on, is also fractal in crypto. So when you see something slightly weird and you look at it carefully, then you realize there's also so much more weird stuff happening in crypto. Um, in this case, to sum things up, for people who are new, Bitfinex was an exchange that um, uh, is still an exchange. It's a fantastic exchange where that uh, whales tend to, to favor. And um, it was doing something slightly odd to appease regulators. So uh, it had uh, constructed a, a wallet, a, a wallets in a, in a certain way so that they're not custodial. So they were moving funds from wallets with the help of BitGo. So Bitfinex and BitGo would together have to sign, sign um, a transaction to move any user's funds. So, so that's fine, that's a reasonable thing to do, um, except that the way the keys were set up, the same key, a single key, um, used on the Bitfinex side was used not only to move the, the funds, but it was also moved to, uh, it was also used to get BitGo to change its limits. So you have an exchange setup where normally you would have all kinds of daily limits. You, you don't want, you know, all of the coins to be drained out of an exchange. So you place some kind of a limit and the key that, that, that uh, that was being used, the hot key on the exchange was also the same key that could make changes to the limits. This is a very bizarre setup. Uh, long story short, things happened. Everybody blames each other, but a lot of coins, about 60, 70 million dollars worth of coins were stolen out of Bitfinex. Now that number ballooned out to 4 billion. And so that is what it is. Um, how did how how could they you know extract so much money? Well, you know somebody got a handle, got a got a hold of this key. We never really found out exactly what happened. There was no real post mortem, and uh, so uh, so it turns out that uh, the 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 police uh, has traced the the funds down to this couple who lived in New York City. It's a really really interesting uh, set of circumstances. Uh, they went through 2,000 transactions, and uh, despite going through 2,000 transactions, the police were able to uh, to trace the funds. And um, it is this uh, person, Ilya and Heather, is the couple. And, um, and one of the interesting things is, as uh, Heather has uh, made a career out of uh, of talking about social engineering, and in fact, she was invited to an event by BitGo, one of the two parties to the social engineering hack. Um, at another time, Tarun Chitra uh, in New York City invited her to give this talk, How to Social Engineer Your Way into Anything. This reminded me of O.J. Simpson's book, by the way. And it's just insane to see this, uh, see all of this in action. So um, I don't know if she socially engineered her way into BitGo or into Bitfinex. We don't know if they are the ones behind the, um, the hack. Um, the, the, the police are not claiming that they are. Uh, they're only claiming that they were uh, they were laundering the the, the funds, and uh, they are currently uh, under arrest uh, with un, in, an under indictment for 20 years for money laundering and I think five years for fraud. And uh, so, uh, uh, one of the most interesting things is that she has a an online persona as Razzle Khan. And if you haven't seen the YouTube videos, search for them. Um, it's, uh, it was fascinating to see this come out. She has a very, very interesting personality. Um, and, uh, you know, um, kudos to her. The, the art is not my style. Um, 
it's uh, it's just kind of cringy. Uh, the quality of the rap is nowhere near, you know, what I listen to. Um, on the other hand, you know, kudos to her for having the courage to stand up there and uh, and just rock rock herself. I was really impressed. And the thing that really got me was the fact that she was the richest Turkish woman. She had four billion to her name. And the next person is a very well-known person in Turkey. She has only $1.9 billion. So she was sitting on top of four billion when she was recording uh, some of these videos. And, um, and so she wasn't doing it for the money. She wasn't doing it for anything. She just was doing it for, for you know, the crowd's uh, appreciation. So she's she's authentic, she's passionate, and um, and I really liked it. It's just it's impossible not to be impressed by what's happening. This is Tiger King level of authenticity. Like these people live and breathe these personas, and uh, I was really impressed. So um, uh, so that's you know takeaway number one. Takeaway number two is the day after this whole thing got exposed. One of the first things that that someone did was take down her videos. So she must have been you know, in jail probably, and she must have used uh, some some of her precious time on the phone with her lawyers, etc., uh, talking about taking the videos down. So um, it was really interesting that uh, that that would even be a concern. That this the, the crowd's appreciation of her persona is really a very very top concern for this person. And um, there's a fascinating character study. There's a fascinating case there for uh, for people who are into into studying other people. I think. Um, for us techies, what's going on? Well, there's obviously the, the, the tabloid element here, but behind the scenes, there's something huge going on and I do want to pay attention to it. Number one, the police were able to follow the trail of funds all the way through uh, to their expenditure points. Did they make mistakes in the process? Sure, they did. They ended up paying for a VPN service without uh, going through an anonymizer and they use their own names in, for that VPN service. That's an elementary mistake. So maybe the law enforcement got, got a hold of identities that way and then managed to, to piece everything through. Um, you know, were they perfect criminals? No. So, um, uh, but they weren't completely clueless. Um, did they store things online? Uh, yes, they did. They stored online a file that contains every address they controlled. This is something you should not do. It's in the same category as uh, taking notes on a criminal conspiracy. And uh, those of you who have seen The Wire or the, the little clip from The Wire know exactly what I'm referring to here. So, uh, but it was actually encrypted. So law enforcement had to decrypt that file. They probably tried I don't know what they did. Um, they might have, they, if I were them, I would try uh, all known words against the file to see if they used a simple, easy password. Maybe they recorded the couple typing their password. That's possible. Um, or uh, who knows? Or maybe they have the ability to reverse whatever encryption is in place. Maybe they bug the software on the, on the laptop. Who knows? Um, but, uh, but they weren't doing, uh, they were doing things in a way that wasn't entirely dumb. Um, I think they were doing things in a way that an average person would kind of do them. And, uh, and so law enforcement was able to easily piece together what seems like a very complex web of transactions. So this shows the power of blockchains. It shows that blockchains transparency is a boost for law, law enforcement. It is not being used uh, any more than other, other mechanisms are being used to hide activities. So, uh, and a savvy, uh, set of uh, law enforcement agents can easily find their way through uh, even even a fairly complicated set of uh, attempts to hide people's identity. So I'm really thrilled to know that you know the law enforcement community is savvy enough to do this. It's really really a testament to how technically talented they are. It's great news for all of us. There really should be no room for crime uh, on uh, on the blockchain. This is not good for the space. The fact that these exchanges are constantly being emptied, it's not good. The centralized exchanges are constantly being attacked and constantly being emptied. These criminals and, and this kind of criminal living is just not, it's, it's not something that I have any respect for. Um, white hat hacking is a cool thing. I, that's something that I can get behind. People who understand and find vulnerabilities and disclose them are wonderful people. 
but uh, stealing this amount if they did, uh, or laundering it if they if they tried to, they, they're certainly alleged to. Uh, they uh, is not something that anybody should be able to get away with, and it's good to know that law enforcement is developing the tools for this. As law enforcement develops these tools, politicians and other people will will start having the the gumption to um, to uh, to accommodate blockchains better. They are currently afraid. It's a new thing. They don't understand, and uh, and, it, and they feel like they're losing control. And remember how things were when back in the mid '90s, when politicians who are used to having a handle on the media started feeling like they were losing control of social media. Social media was very nascent back then, but you know, people would start going on bulletin boards and so forth and say whatever they liked. And the politicians' immediate reaction was, let's ban, let's come up with, with, with ways of knowing who's behind every keystroke. Let's have a driver's license for the internet. And that's, there's a similar effort right now. They now want KYC AML for everything. The burden that JP, JP Morgan or the burden that Goldman Sachs faces is now the same burden that's being placed on everybody on the blockchain. And that's insane. Imagine going to a corner store and, uh, and having, having the corner, the person who operates it, having to vet that you're a good person before they sell you a packet of gum. That's the sort of thing that we're facing with on, in the regulatory domain. And the fact that law enforcement can say, look, it doesn't matter, you know, you do whatever you want, but at some point you will reveal who you are, or if we need to, we can trace your activities. That's, I think, going to give all the regulators a sigh of relief and, and, a, and, a, and a feeling of empowerment. And hopefully the regulators will not come up with insane, insane amounts of uh, burdens for the rest of, of us to follow. And th these, those burdens only slow down uh, the amount of innovation on these chains. So um, overall, I hope this serves as an example to other people who are thinking of committing crimes and so forth. You can't get away. And crime and stealing things that belong to other people, it's, it's not good. It's just like even, and it's not acceptable. Even if you're doing it in a manner that doesn't feel like stealing, you're not going and, and, going and grabbing it from someone else's hands. You're doing it from the comfort of your home. Maybe it feels like trolling. And certainly I've seen, a, you know, there's a generation out there that thinks as long as you say, oh, I was just trolling, then anything is excusable. Um, it isn't. At the end of the day, you are hurting people. The Bitfinex hack hurt a lot of people. And so I'm so thrilled to see that the, the funds have been recovered. Now we're going to have to see if the funds are going to be returned to Bitfinex. Uh, there's a lot of drama to follow. And... Uh, and, and I, I'm super interested about RazzleCon and her next rap songs. And um, uh, is, we're going to see how this goes from here. And I'm, of course, very, very curious about how the hack happened in the first place. So we have a lot of uh, tabloid drama. Um, you know, I got into the space partly because it was colorful. There was always something exciting going on. And, uh, and so this is certainly one of those things. Um, yeah. On, on another note, uh, when I was a kid, when uh, when we would find you know coins on the ground, uh, my mother would make us throw them back. We you could not take a single cent that isn't yours. So why? Because you want to be able to say every single cent you ever made is yours, rightfully made. So um, you know hacking and so on seems cool to a bunch of people, but it's completely unacceptable. Uh, black hack hacking is just complete. Black hat hacking is completely unacceptable. All right, what, what else happened? Um, in, I think I skipped the last, uh, last uh, I was sick, and I had to skip the last episode of All Access last week. So uh, there was the wormhole hack uh, that affected Solana. It, uh, it affected 120,000 uh, ETH, and um, so we're about 100,000 ETH. I think this is, these are really large numbers. I read this, my heart sank. Um, I felt really bad for the people affected and, and, and for the, the, the community that, that's on the other end of this bridge. Um, so I'm super thrilled that, uh, that in, in, in uh, not all that much time, the, 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 uh, uh, the, the funds were restored. And um, so very thrilled to see this. And, uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, this is another case of an attacker going in, finding an op opening and uh, making off with a, with a ton of proceeds. This hacker is trying to, to whitewash that money through, um, through, through uh, 
through tornado cash. We will see how successful they are. Um, sooner or later, you know, these people end up uh, screwing up somehow, and we will see the same law enforcement uh, forces applied here. And, uh, and I'm curious about how this is going to end. Um, earlier this week, on Monday, I had a wonderful chat with, uh, uh, on, uh, on Bankless uh, with uh, Ryan Sean Adams and David Hoffman. So Ryan, I thought, was an extreme, previously, I thought he was an extreme Ethereum maxi. David, I had not met before. Uh, they were both wonderful on this show and wonderful as hosts. Um, and similarly, my co-guests, co uh, Anatoly and Do uh, from Solana and uh, Terra were fantastic. And uh, we hadn't had a chance to chat in a while. I think last time I saw Anatoly, we had dinner in Korea. Um, and uh, so uh, it was really nice to see them on the same show. It was really, really good. And the title, Finding Common Ground, was wonderful. I think uh, it was really collaborative and then very constructive. And a lot of nuance gets lost in these online discussions. And, um, and the thing that gets lost uh, is, um, is that we're all on the same side, all of us, even the ones that are you know, building completely disparate solutions. We are trying to come up with something new to replace the traditional finance systems with. And we've done that, actually. And the things that we have come up with are not going away. They're here to stay. And, uh, and they have a whole bunch of exciting things, exciting features that the traditional system does not have. Many of our day-to-day -day worries, uh, I know this for a fact because I've spoken to all of these uh, folks in detail, obviously before this event, as well as during it, and then of course afterwards, um, many of our worries are very much in common. And uh, the regulatory environment, the, um, uh, the ecosystem, the health of the ecosystem, the security of the ecosystem. These are all things that, that bind us all. And um, so it's really important to remember this, um, uh, especially on the Ethereum and Avalanche side, we're, we're all EVM maxis. We're all helping to make uh, smart contract projects written in Solidity work better. So we have different approaches to scaling. And I happen to believe that it's all chains and bridges. Uh, you can come up with a very complicated nomenclature. You can come up with bridges that are really closely coupled to their chains so that the security of the bridges is higher than security of other kinds of bridges. That's all true. Uh, but um, at the end of the day, we all share uh, the same set of common goals. And uh, which idea uh, for scaling will prevail? No one knows. Um, I happen to think that our flat democratized approach on Avalanche is very compelling. You don't have to build for any kind of a particular specific uh, layer two. You don't have to fracture your system. You don't have to worry about layer two failures. Uh, what you do is you build a very, very uh, uh, decentralized, very robust layer one, and uh, you make that work well. And that's what we're doing at Avalanche. And uh, But there are other approaches. I'm really, really excited about, by the way, the UST stablecoin that Do um, has been implementing on top of the Terra system. It's uh, it's an experiment of a, of a magnitude that we haven't seen before, and um, uh, I don't quite know the exact academic underpinnings or the foundational underpinnings of these uh, stablecoins, uh, but the the experiment so far has been really fascinating to watch, and, and you know, also I mentioned uh, the various things I love about about Solana, uh, and certainly my love for Ethereum. Uh, I don't need to reiterate over here. I've been a member of the Ethereum community for, for a very long time by now. So it's uh, it's been fantastic to have that chat. I think we should have more of it, and, uh, and it'll be fun. Uh, prior to that, um, Vitalik, uh, I think I kind of pr prompted this, and I said, look, there is no real good definition. There is no good nomenclature for the various different kinds of side chains uh, plasma chains, layer twos, et cetera, et cetera, and alternative layer ones. And uh, Vitalik came up with a nomenclature for which I am super grateful. We needed that, and uh, we need a very good, precise understanding of what's what. And, um, and then he made an argument for why the future will be multi-chain, but not cross-chain. So, um, uh, so I think that's, uh, uh, that's been interesting. And... Uh, what I have decided to do is not to, to sort of take on that argument. That is, you know, you can be right and, uh, uh, or 
you know, you can you can fight all your friends and, and, and get into unpleasant and unhappy situations. So in the spirit of finding common ground, I think the, the decision that I made is unless prompted, I'm not going to get into, uh, you know, a tete-a-tete a, a -tete with, with anybody I happen to love. So what I'm going to instead do is just point out a couple of things. Um, Vitalik does have a security characterization of these systems. And I think in editing these slides, I, I didn't leave, leave in the security characterization here, but um, he has a security characterization, but I think it's incorrectly done. I think what, uh, what needs to be done there is actually plug in uh, real, actual um, probabilities of failure. So the layer two approach to scaling fundamentally involves moving things out of a highly decentralized layer one into much smaller layer twos. In so doing, what you're really doing is kind of repeating the exact system that we have right now. You're taking all the value on, uh, on that layer two and awarding it typically, uh, depends on the layer two technology, of course, but typically that, that value is awarded to somebody in a position of central control. And uh, most, not all, there's some kind of an academic layer two, I think, that does have some, uh, some lack, of decent, lack of centralization. But most of the layer twos that you've heard of have highly centralized implementations. That's why they go down as often as they do. And uh, uh, the number of participants to those systems are also fairly small. The reason why they don't get hacked more is because there isn't that much value or because the bridge technologies back are, uh, are incredibly slow. So, uh, so you've, got, uh, you've got a bit of an issue there uh, for taking the funds out. As people try to improve the user experience on these layer twos, I would expect these hacks to be much more frequent and uh, the limitations of the layer two approach to be much more prominent. But I'm not going to belabor this point. Um, we have CryptoSec here pointing out that indeed all of these layer twos bring in their own security assumptions and they bring their own central points of failure and their own centralization. I got into this business because I want to to build decentralized systems. And to build a decentralized platform at the bottom that's only used for settlement by a small set of layer two operators seems to me to be repeating exactly the mistakes of Wall Street right here. It's just, uh, it's just half a mile or so from where I live. So uh, that's not what I want to do. I have no interest in building such a system. And uh, the systems that I care about are systems that are open to all. Anybody should be able to participate. It should be flat and equal for everyone. So, uh, uh, you know, if there's a layer two out there and a DAP on top of it, uh, it's not clear how you're going to get access to that DAP. The layer two is in the prime position to charge you access, to close things for you, etc. I mean, I don't need to belabor this. So we're going to see how this, how this uh, vision evolves, but, um, uh, but my, uh, uh, you know, I've decided, as I said, to not, not butt heads on this topic. I tried as an academic to, um, uh, to influence uh, the, the sort of the prog 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 progression of uh, development in this space. Um, I succeeded in some ways. Um, I, I didn't always. And um, I found overall that it's just very taxing because, you know, people have their own agendas. They have their own egos. They're, they're wedded to their solutions or in the case that they're incredibly, uh, you know, open-minded, et cetera, even then it's a, it's a very taxing process to take some, some group of people and to say, hey, look, you know, you all believe this, that, and the other. Some of these beliefs are unfounded. They're not based on sound scientific principles. Here, there's another way of, of looking at it. Typically, they, they're not, these are all brilliant people. Uh, they are typically, uh, uh, they typically have a bad framework. You know, they're looking at it in a, in a, in a manner that's, you know, that's skewed somehow. And, uh, and what you really end up having to do is, is end up providing to people a different framework. It's a different way of looking at things. And when you do, you know, then you, you come to a different set of conclusions. It's a very taxing, taxing process. So what I think I will do is just, we'll just let it play out. So Avalanche is here, it's working. If you want to play with it, it's yours to play with. You want to deploy things on it, yours to, yours to deploy. There's no one who can come in between you and that deployment. And um, there are many other ways of scaling. So I, I encourage everyone to, you know, everyone who wants to, to experiment with their own vision. And uh, instead of saying, hey, that won't happen, um, then uh, instead I will just sit here and watch what happens. And uh, what I don't want to do is get into a, a scenario where I say something that's correct 
and get get a lot of heat for it. And then, you know, years later, when I'm proven right, nobody comes back and acknowledges what that what you said was right. So this happened many times in my career. It happened with selfish mining. It happened with a whole bunch of other things. So, uh, you know, I don't want to repeat that process. It's very taxing. And certainly, I don't want to lose friends in the process. So uh, one of the main things I care about is when I'm older and I retire someplace, I want to reminisce with all the people that I happen to like uh, about the old, good old days of crypto. And, uh, and, and I want to enjoy the good old days of crypto as I live, live, them, live them out. So um, I'm not going to sort of battle anything. We're just going to let things be. And, uh, and we'll, see, uh, we'll see how these chains pan out. Um, there's a lot of exciting things happening on Avalanche, as I mentioned. And uh, our vision is being borne out. And I'll get to that in two seconds, I think. But before I get there, let me mention this. This is really cool stuff. Um, CCRI is an independent uh, institution for, for rating uh, technologies. It's called the Crypto Carbon Ratings Institute. They did a very large study. And um, the results of that study is that um, Avalanche is incredibly sustainable. It consumes a very, very modest amount of energy to maintain, about 46 U.S. households worth of energy per year. So running Avalanche as decentralized as it is, as it is now is about 46 U.S. households. Let that sink in. Think about 46 households. I can see just from the window here in front of me behind the camera, I can see more than 46 households. That's, that's more than Avalanche. So the lights they consume and the heat they consume. Now, um, uh, Avalanche has many, many times in its lifetime proven critics wrong. Like people said all sorts of things about consensus protocols, we proved them wrong. People said all sorts of things about bridges, we proved them wrong. Now, um, I think the eco-friendliness issue is a very important one. This is something I hear about, especially from artists all the time. They're concerned. They're a different sort of kind of person, right? They're not the crypto crowd who's like, oh, I, I'm going to get rich, therefore anything's okay. They're kind of like, hey, I have art. I care about things. I care about grander things. And I don't want to be part of a movement that's destroying the earth. And now we're saying, hey, look, you can build these things and, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and be part of a movement that is incredibly sustainable. Just so as to give people an idea of uh, energy consumption, Avalanche, as I mentioned, consumes 46 households worth of energy. Ethereum 1, as it is now, consumes 1 million households worth of energy. So NFTs issued there are part of an energy consumption that's about 1M. And Bitcoin consumes about 8 million households. So uh, the mining rewards are far larger in Bitcoin, and so it attracts much more energy usage and uh, and so, therefore, what's happening with Bitcoin is, is it's indeed eating up a fair portion of the world, world's electricity supply. Now, we can all say, hey, look, isn't that worse? Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know all of those arguments. And uh, you can also say, hey, these are coming from green sources. I'm not so sure about that. Um, but uh, even when they're coming from green sources, the proof of work consumption, it's coming, it's displacing other uses. You could use this energy to do something else, maybe heat up a million households for free. You know, there's poverty in the US, go heat them up. You know, it's like 9 million households would be pretty substantial. Um, so, uh, you know, we can go on, on this topic for a while. So I don't like these whataboutism arguments. We should just build the best technology for decentralization. And we should then make it as sustainable as possible. And that's what we would strive to do with Avalanche. It is the most decentralized platform that I know of because it can accommodate millions of participants in each round of decision. It doesn't cut people out. It doesn't leave people out. And, uh, and it's much more efficient than, uh, than mining-based protocols. And to be fair, you know, the other proof-of-stake protocols are not bad either. They, they also consume you know, orders of magnitude less than other mining-based protocols. Okay, so uh, oh, this was a good uh, development. Uh, National Geographic ended up issuing some NFTs on top of Avalanche, and uh, they're beautiful. And uh, I don't know if you got a chance to see it, but here it is again. And um, it was very important for them to not issue on, on a, uh, a proof-of-work chain. Um, I also know some really, really well-known artists, and um, 
they're like, look, if I, I go to these museums and if, if they knew that a piece of artwork that I have is, has been you know, turned into an NFT and issued on something that's, that's, uh, that's energy consumptive, then they won't display that art. So uh, you can't go to Munich, you cannot go to Berlin and say, hey, you know, uh, I'm going to use, you know, I've, I've, done, I've made an NFT and, uh, you know, in the process, I uh, destroyed so much habitat or, or melted down so many of the poles. It's just not, it's a no-go. So it's wonderful to see National Geographic doing this on top of us, um, and we'll probably see far more to come. Let me see if I can go on to the next. Oh, there we go. Um, okay, so uh, the uh, other topic, again, today we've talked a lot about security. Um, the, uh, there's a lot of malware going around. The number and amount and complexity of malware is increasing. And, um, and so uh, what's the best way to combat this? You should always use a, a secure uh, signing device to keep your private keys. Don't ever type your mnemonic into a browser window um, and uh, uh, always double check what you're signing because there's malware out there that's going to show you that you're signing something, but it will send uh, another transaction to the, the signing device, to the ledger. And so uh, the ledger should display on its little screen exactly what you're about to do. And you should make an informed decision that yes, that is indeed what you want to sign. So um, now there is some new malware, malware that's targeting MetaMask and other crypto wallets. And so this is really problematic. Please don't get bitten by this. I don't want your precious coins in the hands of hackers. Uh, I know you will do well with them. I know the hackers are going to do stupid things with them. And the world can only tolerate so much bad rap. So please uh, buy a ledger. Uh, they're not all that expensive. And, um, and then only ever type your keys into the ledger by hand with the little input, never ever into a browser, never ever take a picture of your words because they're stored in cloud storage and a sysadmin can get to them. Uh, never ever leave those uh, words lying around. Uh, don't keep them in your house. Uh, don't keep them on your person. Don't travel with them. The only thing you should ever have is a ledger and uh, and that's, that's, that should be your primary means of security. Um, okay, oh yeah, the particle mint have, took place. Uh, this is, I love this Banksy. This was the first Banksy I ever saw. And uh, this Molotov cocktail replaced by a bouquet of flowers being thrown at the police is so amazing. And, um, you know, for those of you who've lived through street protests of different kinds, um, you know, those of you who, who saw the Arab Spring, maybe those of you who in your own countries protested uh, against, well, I don't even care what cause, um, you know that the best way to win hearts and minds is actually with, with love. And um, this, this drawing is so poignant, so, so powerful. And uh, so Particle is the name of the company that bought it. And uh, it was on display in Miami uh, at the, the, uh, 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 at the, the, the BNL, I think. So uh, uh, let's see. So what they are doing is they divided it into 10,000 little pieces and uh, they are selling those pieces. So I'm, I'm really excited. And, um, and Paris Hilton ended up buying a piece. Uh, they were in the New York Times prior to this. And uh, I think Paris and somehow went and, and got, got a copy. I don't know if she got that one. Maybe she got a flower. That would be really cool if she did. So... Um, uh, so yeah, it's, it's a great idea. Um, some art should really be owned by the people. Street art, by its very nature, should be owned by people. And um, I'm super thrilled that Particle gives us a way to do that. They have grand plans to, uh, to, to buy and sell in NFT form a hell of a lot of other paint paintings that you and I know very well. And uh, I'm really excited. So, um, so anyway, so this is the Particle event and it's happening. Ah, this... Um, we started releasing more and more subnet software. I think I talked to you about the uh, Spaces uh, sample virtual machine that got started in its own subnet. And uh, recently, my VP of engineering, Patrick O'Grady at Ava Labs, uh, just you know, in his spare time, created this thing called WagMe. We're all going to make it subnet. So uh, it's just its own subnet. It runs the EVM. It runs the EVM with very aggressive settings, much faster than normal. 
and uh, a lot of people are using it. There's like a bunch of dApps on it, and um, it's all based on uh, on the Fuji testnet. And um, and there's a there's a community that's um, running Dark Forest on it. Dark Forest is just a, is a, is a game that uh, uh, that operates here. So Spaces is for storing data, and this is for running really really fast EVM applications. So uh, uh, really excited about this. And uh, and so and Neon Monsters have deployed on it. Pangolin has deployed on the Wagme subnet. You know, there's like a, a thing happening on it. I didn't even know this was happening. It's Patrick's sort of passion project on the side, and uh, it's taking off. So it's kind of fun. Take a look, play with it. It's a good way to understand what subnets are all about. We could do this all day. We could create as many subnets as we care to create. There is no subnet auction. They're just there for the taking. You too could create your own blockchains on top of Avalanche. I highly encourage you to. There's nothing to lose, and uh, it's so fun. And uh, and you can create if you actually produce innovations that go into your virtual machine. You could create immense value. On that note, I think uh, I've wrapped up everything for this week. Um, it's been it's been a fun ride uh, in the last I think two weeks. I'm sorry I was very sick last Friday. And uh, uh, but uh, uh, there's been a lot of exciting things happening. Uh, the uh, macro situation will go up and down. That's guaranteed. If it goes up too much, I think the feds will step in and make it go down. If it goes down too much, the feds will step in and make it go up. So we're kind of guaranteed to be in a sideways market. And um, it will probably be in that sideways holding pattern for uh, some time to come. These times are the best times for me and I hope for other builders out there. Uh, it's a quiet time, relatively speaking. There's so much work to be done, far fewer distractions, and the crypto space is what it is. I think it's during these times that high technology uh, steps up. That's when you notice the, the good because it, it shines in, in bad times. In good times, everything shines. You know, the dog coins go to the moon. But, um, but it's, it's times like this when everything's sideways that the true connoisseurs know what's value. And um, and so it's been it's been fun. It's good, and uh, there's so much more to come for the space as a whole. I'm super bullish um, in the long term, and uh, and I know that you know 10 years from now everything around me is going to be on a blockchain somehow. And uh, I've built the kind of system I think that uh, uh, or I've helped build, I should say, um, that uh, that uh, allows that value to be created on top. And uh, I'm really excited about this, uh, about what we are building. And I'm, I'm really excited to have you guys on this journey along with me. So thank you very much. Have a great weekend. And, uh, and I'll see you next week.